What is Christianity? Part 7. The letter named Galatians. It appears that in consequence of the opposition of Peter and Barnabas to Paul, a large group of original Christians cut themselves off from Paul. To the extent that the area of Galatia which was inhabited by Gentiles became subject to discord. The result was that the people of Galatia began to regard Paul in a bad light. Hence, Paul, whilst in Antioch vada a letter to the Galatians wherein he strongly opposed those who regarded the law of Torah as binding to a degree on the Gentiles. For a number of reasons, this letter stands out amongst all the letters of Paul. One reason is that it is chronologically the first of the 14 letters of Paul. Second, because this was the first time that Paul openly propounded his theories. Prior to this, he had not so clearly set forth his theories. Thirdly, he appears hostile in this letter and repeatedly curses his opponents. Fourthly, he indicated for the first time that he was not in need of any disciple to learn the Christian faith, but that he acquired his knowledge directly through revelation. In order to understand Paul properly, it is necessary to study this letter carefully. Hence, we set out below certain important aspects if Peter intended to abrogate the law of Moses permanently for the Gentiles. Then he ought to have also abrogated it for the Jewish Christians. If he found the law intolerable for the one, he would have found it so for the other. The purpose of writing this important letter was that certain Jewish Christians had attacked the gospel which Paul had conveyed to the churches of Galatia. The teaching of these false teachers was that the gospel which was proclaimed by Paul was only the first step in a Christian life. In order to derive full blessing, it was necessary for the new converts to act on the Jewish law, 3 to 3. They slandered Paul as a man without principle. He himself acted on the Jewish law but did not demand the same from his converts. Their method of attack was that he, Paul, was different from the twelve disciples, and therefore had no right. For the disciples were superior in all respects to Paul. It is apparent that such arguments caused a disturbance amongst the majority of the Galatians, and the opponents of Paul thereby achieved their object. Galatians, 13-3. In Encyclopedia Britannica the purpose of the letter is stated as follows. It was only later that he heard of a danger of a relapse, owing to the influence of some agitators who persuaded the Galatians that the apostle was not really authorized. That his gospel required to be supplemented by closer adherence to the Jewish code, that ritual and even circumcision were needful to a full Christian life. As the primitive and original apostles taught. In other words, the Galatians were induced to believe that the sole valid charter to privileges in the messianic order of Christ lay in observance of the Jewish law which remained obligatory upon all converts, even on those who came over from paganism. These intruders belonged to the Jewish Christian party and the primitive church. They feared deeply that the ethical interests of the church would be compromised if the Jewish law were dropped, and also their sympathies were with the party of Jews. As reflected in the story of Acts 15. These excerpts produce the following conclusions. 1. The opponents of Paul at Galatia were distinguished members of the old church. 2. They were of the view that the Gentiles who entered the fold of Christianity without circumcision, this was their first step. In order to live a complete Christian life, they had to undergo circumcision and abide by the law of Torah. 3. They asserted that the interpretation of the Christian faith was the right of the disciples and not Paul. 4. According to their view, the teaching of the original disciples was to the effect that circumcision and adherence to the law of Torah was necessary for a complete Christian life. It is clear therefore that the original objection of the opponents of Paul was that he was opposed to the disciples, which he was not and it led to do. Hence if the disciples were of the same view as Paul, then the correct course for Paul to follow was to cause the disciples to write a letter in his defense. Or to state in his own letter that his views were the same as those of the disciples. The disciples, bearing in mind, had already issued a ruling at the Council of Jerusalem that circumcision and other details of the law of Torah were not necessary. However, Paul did not even write one sentence in his letter to the Galatians to the effect that his views were the same as those of the disciples. Instead, he claimed that he was not in need of the protection or learning of the disciples, but that in fact he received his learning directly from God by way of revelation. He writes, For I would have you to know, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Gal 1 11. But on the contrary, he proceeds to declare Peter as condemned and Barnabas as insincere, 2 11, and endeavors to prove that he received revelation directly from God. It is therefore clear that the angle from which Paul was writing his letter to the Galatians was not concurred in by the disciples. Otherwise, he would have stated at the outset that the disciples agree with him thereby terminating the discussion. An objection may be raised to the effect that according to Christian scholars of recent times, the letter to Galatians was written prior to the Council of Jerusalem. Hence, because the viewpoint of the disciples on the issue was not known prior to the Council, Paul did not quote them in his letter. In our view, it is wrong to say that the letter to the Galatians was written prior to the Council of Jerusalem. Because Paul writes in the letter. But when Cephas, Peter, came to Antioch I opposed him to his face, because he stood condemned. 2.11. Here, Paul maintains the coming of Peter to Antioch, 
This must have occurred after the Council of Jerusalem, just as Encyclopedia Britannica states. Britannica, Galatians, Epistle to the, Volume 9, p.97. In Galatians 2.11 Paul reveals that despite the covenant of Jerusalem, Peter displayed an indecision in his policy towards the Gentiles. It follows that this event must have occurred after the meeting of the Council of Jerusalem. In addition, most biographers of Paul hold that the event occurred after manner. And the words themselves allude to the fact that the event occurred after the convening of the Council of Jerusalem. Because Paul could only condemn Peter if the latter acted contrary to his then jesting statements. If Peter did not previously declare that the Gentiles were permitted not to abide by the law of Torah, then how could Paul so easily condemn him? The words clearly convey that Peter supported Paul at the Council of Jerusalem, and now opposed him. Hence, the convening of the Council of Jerusalem preceded the coming of Peter to Antioch since Paul mentions the coming of Peter to Antioch in his letter to Galatians. It follows that the letter was written after the Council of Jerusalem. Accordingly, in our view, the viewpoint of the early Christian scholars is correct, as stated by G. D. Manley Britannica, Volume 17, p. 642, Article Peter. The view was expressed before that Paul wrote the letter to the churches of Galatia during his missionary journeys at a time when he wrote the letter to the Romans. And this event occurred after the Council of the Acts 15 inches. Conclusions The foregoing discussion has conclusively established I hey following. 1. In the beginning, Barnabas and the other disciples believed that Paul had truly brought faith in Christianity. 2. On this basis, Barnabas stayed with Paul for a long period of time. 3. Thereafter, Barnabas separated himself from Paul on the grounds of theological and theoretical differences. 4. The Council of Jerusalem did not permanently abrogate circumcision and adherence to the detailed law of Torah for the Gentiles. But the disciples permitted the Gentiles to accept Christianity without adhering to the law as a first step towards living a complete Christian life. 5. However, Paul began to preach that all the laws of the Torah were abrogated. The laws were a curse from which they were redeemed. 3.13, and that if they underwent circumcision, Christ would be of no advantage to them. 5 1. Hence, Peter and Barnabas opposed Paul at Antioch. 6. As a result of the opposition of the disciples, a tremendous outcry against Paul arose to the effect that he had opposed the disciples. In response, Paul wrote the letter to the Galatians. 7. In that letter, instead of concurring with the disciples, he opposed them. He directed his endeavors to prove that he received knowledge directly through revelation and therefore was not in need of being taught by the disciples. Gal 1 11 12. 8. The letter was written after the convening of the Council of Jerusalem. It followed that the support which Paul received from the disciples at the council now ended. The disciples now opposed him, and therefore Paul did not make reference to support from the disciples in his letter. 9. All the letters of Paul were written after this event. Because according to G. T. Manley, the letter written to the Galatians is chronologically Paul's first letter. Hence, the doctrines of Trinity, Redemption, Incarnation and Abrogation of Law of Torah represent the personal theories of Paul, and were not supported by the disciples. After Separation now, we will attempt to see where Barabbas went after his serious contention with Paul. The Acts indicate only that after his separation with Paul he went to Cyprus with Mark. Apart from this, the Acts make no mention of him. Other Christian histories are totally silent of the later life of Barnabas. The Encyclopedia Britannica says G. D. Manley, p. 373. When Barnabas sails away with Mike to resume work in Cyprus, the mists of history close about him. Only now and again we catch fugitive glimpses of him and his work. The question is that Barnabas was a leading personality of early Christianity, and devoted his whole life to preaching and propagating Christianity was not worthy, after his separation from Paul, of being mentioned by the pupils of Paul, such as Luke, albeit in a few lines. The conclusion is inescapable that Barnabas knew the reality of Paul, and thereafter endeavored to inform people of the distortions being introduced by Paul in Christianity. Hence, the pupils of Paul would obviously not mention him. Gospel of Barnabas this rational conclusion becomes virtually a fact when we read the first page of the Gospel of Barnabas which was found in the 16th century in the private library of Pope Scuts. Dearly beloved, the great and wonderful God hath during these past days visited us by his prophet Jesus Christ in great mercy of teaching and miracles, by reason whereof many being deceived of Satan. Under pretense of piety, are preaching most impious doctrine, calling Jesus Son of God, repudiating the circumcision ordained of God forever and permitting every unclean meat among whom also Paul hath been deceived, whereof I speak not without grief, for which cause I am writing the truth which I have seen and heard. In the intercourse that I have had with Jesus, in order that ye may be saved and not be deceived of Satan and perish in the judgment of God. Therefore beware of everyone that preacheth unto you new doctrine contrary to that which write, that ye may be saved eternally. This is the gospel of Barnabas in relation to which great efforts were made to obliterate it. In the 5th century BC, 
100 years before the coming of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, Pope Gelasius I issued an edict to the effect that the reader of this gospel is a criminal. And today it is claimed that it has been written by a Muslim Britannica, Volume 3, p.118, Article, Barnabas. Hence, there can be no doubt whatsoever that present-day Christianity represents the theories of Paul, and is not connected whatsoever with the teaching of Jesus or his disciples. Paul and Peter After looking at the relationship between Paul and Barnabas, we now look at the relationship between Paul and Peter, and whether Peter supported or opposed the theories of Paul. Peter is more important because he is regarded as the head of the Catholic Church, and the highest in rank amongst all the disciples. 1. The Acts, which explains the endeavors of the disciples sets out until the 15th chapter the details of practically all the endeavors of Peter. In that period, Peter and Paul were of the same view. But it is astonishing that the Acts which supposed to set out the activities of the disciples, suddenly become silent, and does not mention the name of Peter in its last chapter, 28. McKinnon writes see generally, Britannica, Volume 3, p.118. After the Jerusalem Conference Peter disappears from the narrative in Acts, p.116. Encyclopedia Britannica says. McKinnon, p. 116. In the Acts, the final reference to Peter is connected with the Council of Jerusalem, where he adopted a broad-minded policy towards the Gentiles. The question naturally arises. Why does Peter who is regarded as the greatest disciple and who is mentioned until the 15th chapter suddenly become so unimportant that he is not mentioned further at all? The answer is found in Paul's letter to the Galatians which has been mentioned repeatedly. But when Cephas, Peter, came to Antioch I opposed him to face, because he stood condemned. Gal 2 colon 11 As mentioned before, this event took place immediately after the convening of the Council of Jerusalem. Hence, the conclusion is inescapable that Luke mentions Peter until the Council of Jerusalem because Peter had not opposed Paul until then. But thereafter at Antioch, when Peter opposed him, due to his theories, Luke stopped mentioning events relating to Peter. 2. In the light of these indications, it is most probable that as a consequence of the dispute at Antioch, Peter also separated himself from Paul just as Barnabas did. And he formed a group apart from Paul so that the correct doctrines of Christianity could be preached. This is supported by the following statement of Paul in his letter to the Corinthians, 1. For it has been reported to me that there is quarreling among you. What I mean is that each one of you says, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Paul. Or I belong to Cephas, Peter, I belong to Christ. Cor 1 12. It is clear that Cephas, Peter, had at that time formed his own group which was separate from the group of Paul, and that there was dissension between these two groups. The same conclusion is reached by Encyclopedia Britannica which states, The words of Corinthians indicate that Peter had a separate following among the Corinthians. This is the only reference to Peter after the Council of Jerusalem. It is apparent that it is not difficult to conclude that Peter made many endeavors to save the original Christian religion from the distortions of Paul. Unfortunately, all the available material of that time was written by the followers of Paul. Hence, we cannot say where Peter went thereafter, and what sacrifices he made. Some say that he lived in Asia Minor, and more particularly in the regions of Babylon. Irenaeus, Lament and others say that he lived in Rome. Jerome says that he lived in Antioch. There is no certainty about the circumstances surrounding his death. Tyrolean says that the Emperor Nehru killed him. Origen says that he was crucified. Then follow me so that God will love you. I had one of the most challenging experiences with two Christian South African siblings, and the brother's wife, who was a Buddhist high. The woman and her brother were white South Africans, and they were remarkably tall and massive, while the brother's wife was very short and tiny. I was confused at first by the differences in the heights, the body frames, and the visitors' beliefs. I was supposed to start my conversation with them by a short presentation about Islam. Instead, I was surprised with the fluency of non-stop talking by the South African woman, she barely gave me a chance to utter one word. She kept saying, God is love. God loves you. God died for you. I then held myself up and said to her, All right. I'm ready to embrace Christianity if you answered my questions. The visitor cheered up, and she went to bring her sister-in-law to let her listen to our conversation, she was in another corner of the mosque, taking pictures. I understood that the South African lady had been trying to convince her Buddhist sister-in-law to convert to Christianity since a long time. And she thought that if I accept converting to Christianity, it would be a motivation for her sister-in-law to do the same. In the presence of her sister-in-law, the visitor said to me, Well, I'm ready, tell me your questions. I said to her, You said that God loves me and that he died to forgive my sins. She said, Yes, that's right. I asked, Would the love I have for my son make me kill myself to forgive his sins? With all his love for me, is God unable to forgive me if I just repent and turn back to him? Can the love, God has for me make him punish me for a sin committed by someone else, Adam's sin, and then grant me salvation just if I believed in the death of another person on a cross?
not for my good deeds? Was God with all his love to Jesus unable to protect him from killing and crucifixion? How come God may die when he is ever living and does not die in your creed? Isn't this a contradiction? According to what you believe, when God died for three days, who was managing the universe in his claimed absence? Who gave the provisions, lives and caused death? God is omnipotent, does it suit his majesty to be fixed to a wooden beam? To be tortured to death as you claim, especially that the crucified person is considered cursed in your book? In which chapter in your book, did Jesus say that he is God? When Jesus cried and prayed to God for help when they wanted to crucify him, did he pray to himself? Exalted is God, God the Almighty is high above what they say. And, for, they're saying, indeed, we have killed the Messiah, Jesus the Son of Mary, the Messenger of Allah. And they did not kill him, nor did they crucify him. But, another, was made to resemble him to them. And indeed, those who differ over it are in doubt about it. They have no knowledge of it except the following of assumption. And they did not kill him, for certain. Rather, Allah raised him to himself. And ever is Allah exalted in might and wise. Quran 4, 157-158 God is perfect, he does not need to die for us. He gives life and death, so he did not die, nor was he resurrected. He saved his prophet Jesus and protected him as he helps and protects his chosen believers. Then we will save our messengers and those who have believed. Thus, it is an obligation upon us that we save the believers. Quran 10, 103 As I was asking my questions, I noticed her confusion, fret, and peeping gazes to her sister-in-law, and I felt that she got worried from the influence of my talk on her sister-in-law. So, she told me that she is in a hurry, and without replying to any of my questions she said to me, I liked your dress so much, then she hugged me tightly to the point that I was frightened. She then grabbed her sister-in-law's hand and left the mosque right away. I also remember facing a similar situation with a religious Christian, a French man. He said to me, God loves you, he died for you. I asked him, who told you that? God himself or Jesus? He replied, Saint Paul did. He was a smart and educated man. His educational level was the same level as a person who holds three doctorates in our time. I said, what is the relation between Paul's educational level and the divine revelation? He told me, he saw a vision telling him that the Almighty God died for us. I told him, the divine revelation comes from God, including the revelation descending with the divine messages. On the other hand, it's the devilish revelation that comes in the form of dreams to humans. He laughed at my response. I proceeded, human knowledge is a human production that is subjected to correctness and error. It includes scientific achievement or inspiring literature, and it has nothing to do with divine revelation. Finally, I told him, I do not have much information on this point. But I am shocked from a person who leaves the right message of the Messiah which is a divine revelation and goes for a vision of a person who had never met the Messiah during his life such as Paul. And that is just because he is educated. This is insensible and is in all means opposing to both instinct and rationale. Paul was one of the Messiah's worst enemies who tried to destroy his religion, kill him, and torment his followers. I continued, for me, as a person who loves the Messiah, I must believe in his message. In your book, the Messiah said, God is only one God. Mark 12 29. Saint Paul said, 3 and 1. Corinthians 12 3 to 6. In your book, the Messiah said, I ascend unto my Father, and your Father, and to my God, and your God. John 17 20. Paul said, the Messiah is the only begotten Son of God. Galatians 4, 4 5. In your book, the Messiah said, that I do nothing of myself. John 35. Paul said, Jesus is omnipotent. John 5 15. In your book, the Messiah said, My Father is greater than I. John 28 14. Paul said, God, in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Hebrews 3 1. So please tell me, whom shall I believe now the Messiah or Paul? The French visitor said, You know all that and you claimed that you don't have any information. Would you allow me to take some photos because I have a necessary appointment to go to? I told him, please do.